Good morning. My name is Pastor Evelyn Craighead, and I'm a slave of Jesus Christ. And I would like to welcome you to the Feeding House Ministries, a teaching ministry that focuses on your soul and your eternal destiny. A ministry that uncompromisingly teaches the truth of God's word. And our scripture teaching this morning comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And I will be reading verses 1 through 5 from the New King James Version. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. My subject for this morning is sound preaching. Amen. The Corinthian church was deeply divided and two of the issues dividing it were a dispute over what kind of preacher should fill their pulpit and which former minister had contributed the most to their church. And the church desperately needed to understand what preaching really was. Because only if they understood what God intended preaching to be could they hope to solve their differences. Amen. And one of the strong solutions to division is sound preaching. Amen. Paul said, and I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. Sound preaching isn't eloquence and neither is it human wisdom or philosophy. This is Paul's personal testimony and it's emphatic, it's forceful. Paul stresses a critical fact. Sound preaching is not eloquence and he emphasizes that the concern of preaching isn't to be eloquence, human wisdom, or philosophy. Amen. In the Greek, eloquence actually means superiority. Mm. Elevation, being first, domination, or rising above. Mm. Remember, Paul isn't speaking so much about himself, but about words, although the behavior of a person could be involved. Paul didn't try to sound more superior, mm -hmm. more elevated, and more eloquent in his preaching. He wasn't concerned in the least with his preaching rising above and being more dominant and recognized in the preaching of others because sound preaching isn't human wisdom or philosophy. Amen. And Paul faced the same kind of situation we face today. And in reality, the same kind of situation that every generation of believers face, a world that stresses the philosophy of humanism. Mm -hmm. The world, no matter its generation, is constantly seeking more and more wisdom, education, science, and technology, and more and more new and novel ideas, mm -hmm. in particular ideas, ideas dealing with reality and truth. Yeah. And all of these pursuits aren't only worthwhile, they're absolutely essential for our welfare. Mm -hmm. The problem is that we seek these pursuits, these interests, these activities, hobbies, and recreation within the framework of this world, forgetting about God entirely. Amen. And as a result, the world's wisdom, education, science, technology, reality, and truth are only for this world. Amen. And of course, the destiny of all this in the world is corruption and death. There's no fulfilling foundation and there's no permanency to anything that's in this world. Amen. Everything in this world is unfulfilling. It passes away and it ceases to exist. Yeah. This is the reason Paul didn't preach human philosophy or worldly wisdom. When Paul preached, 
He wasn't concerned with sounding like a philosopher or some deep thinker or some preacher and theologian with a new and novel idea or position. Amen. Sound preaching is declaring the testimony of God. And testimony means the mystery or revelation of God, yeah. which is Jesus Christ and him crucified. Amen. Paul is not delivering eloquent speeches and neither is he delivering sound advice on self-development, self-image, positive thinking, mm -hmm. philosophy, or religion and its rituals. Mm -hmm. And neither is he delivering sound advice on education, science, new ideas, novel ideas, or history. Mm -hmm. And yes, all of these have their place. And what truth lies within each one needs to be taught. But they are not the subjects that are to be preached by God's ministers Amen. to a lost and dying world. A world that's reeling under the weight of lonely, empty, starving, and suffering masses of people. The genuine preacher of God is to preach the testimony, the mystery, the revelation of God. Amen. Paul said, for I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Sound preaching has one great thing, Jesus Christ and him crucified. The phrase I determined means to have decided, to have made a decision. Paul had made a deliberate decision, a strong determination to preach only Jesus Christ and him crucified. Yes. But Paul's theme wasn't Jesus the great model for men. Jesus the great teacher, Jesus the great man of purpose, Jesus the great example, or Jesus the great martyr. Mm -hmm. The message of Paul was Jesus Christ, his person as the Son of God, who was made for us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. The message of Paul was Jesus Christ crucified, and Paul declared that he was determined not to know anything among them except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Amen. He said he would forget about everything yes. except Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. What a forceful and emphatic statement, an absolutely clear statement. The thrust of Paul's preaching was the death of Jesus Christ. The theme of Paul's preaching was the death of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. The message of Paul's preaching was the death of Jesus Christ. Yes. The principle of Paul's preaching was the death of Jesus Christ and the heart of Paul's preaching was the death of Jesus Christ. Yes. Paul concentrated on the death of Jesus Christ and when we look at what scripture says, the reason is clearly seen because it's by the death of Jesus Christ that we are cleansed and freed from all sin. First John chapter one verse seven says, but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. It's by the death of Jesus Christ that we are accepted and reconciled to God and have peace with God. Colossians chapter 1 verse 20 says, And by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. It's by the death of Jesus Christ that we are justified. Romans chapter five, verse nine says much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Amen. It's by the death of Jesus Christ that we are eternally redeemed. Mm -hmm. Colossians chapter one, verse 14 says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. It's by the death of Jesus Christ that we are delivered from death. And it's by the death of Jesus Christ that we are delivered from condemnation. Yes. Romans chapter 8 verse 34 says, Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. It is by the death of Jesus Christ that we are delivered from the curse of the law, that is from death and separation from God. Mm -hmm. Galatians chapter 3 verse 13 says Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law having become a curse for us for it is written cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. It is by the death of Jesus Christ that we are delivered from the judgment and wrath to come. Mm 
First Thessalonians chapter one, verse 10 says, and to wait for him, to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. It's by the death of Jesus Christ that we're delivered from this present evil, corruptible and dying world. Mm. Galatians chapter one, verse four says, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world, this evil age, according to the will of our God and father. Amen. It's by the death of Jesus Christ that Satan's power over death and the world is broken and destroyed. Hebrews chapter two, verses 14 through 15 says, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those through fear, who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. It's by the death of Jesus Christ that we are healed. Isaiah 53, 5 says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. Amen. It's by the death of Jesus Christ that we are given all things. Romans chapter eight, verse 32 says, for who, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things. Yeah. It's by the death of Jesus Christ that those without strength are saved. And it's by the death of Jesus Christ that the ungodly are saved. Mm -hmm. Romans chapter five, verse six says, for when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Yeah. It's by the death of Jesus Christ that sinners are saved. Mm. Romans chapter five, verse eight says, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. It's by the death of Jesus Christ that the enemies of God are saved. Mm. Romans chapter five, verse 10 says, for if we, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. It's by the death of Jesus Christ that the unjust are saved. Mm -hmm. First Peter chapter three, verse 18 says, for Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the spirit. It's by the death of Jesus Christ that all people are drawn to Christ. John chapter 12, verse 32 says, and I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. It's by the death of Jesus Christ that we have access into the holy presence of God. Hebrews chapter 10 verses 19 through 20 says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. It's by the death of Jesus Christ that the great love of God is revealed to us. Yes. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 2 says, And walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma. It's by the death of Jesus Christ that we are freed from a self-centered mm -hmm. life and live for Christ. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse 15 says, and he died for all that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Amen. <clears throat> It's by the death of Jesus Christ that we are enabled to live in the righteousness of God. Mm. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse 21 says, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Amen. It's by the death of Jesus Christ that we are taught to love and sacrifice our lives for others. Mm. First John chapter three, verse 16 says, by this we know love because he laid down his life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren and the brethren is the believer. It's by the death of Jesus Christ that our consciences are genuinely clear so that we can serve God and bear fruit. Hebrews nine verse 14 says, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, 
cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Amen. It's by the death of Jesus Christ that we know the power of God. Mm. First Corinthians chapter one, verse 18 says, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Hallelujah. It's by the death of Jesus Christ that we are enabled to purge out the old sins. First Corinthians chapter five, verse seven says, therefore purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump Sincerely, since you truly are unleavened, for indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. It's by the death of Jesus Christ that we are reconciled to people. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 13 through 14 and 16 through 18 says, But now you have been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away from God, but now you have been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people when in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross, and our hostility toward each other was put to death. Now all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. It's by the death of Jesus Christ that Jesus Christ gained the right to be exalted mm -hmm. as the Lord of the dead and the living. Amen. Romans chapter 14 verse 9 says, For to this end Christ died and rose and lived again, that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. It's by the death of Jesus Christ that the church of God was purchased. Acts chapter 20 verse 28 says, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Just imagine the death of Jesus Christ did all of this for us. This is the power of sound preaching. Amen. Paul said, I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. Sound preaching is proclaimed with a great sense of inadequacy. And Paul had reasons to feel so inadequate. Apparently, Paul's personal appearance wasn't impressive, at least not to the Corinthians. Mm. Paul says that he was weak in body and that he suffered some physical infirmity. Now, this shouldn't matter to a congregation of God's people, but it mattered to the Corinthians because there were some among the Corinthians who were more interested in the charisma, the worldly ability and preaching skills of a pastor than in his depth and knowledge of the Lord. And unfortunately, this seems to have been the emphasis among many people of the Corinthian church as well as many in our churches today. Mm -hmm. Paul may have been a small frame man and a man with the knowledge, gifts, and a voice geared more to teaching than to preaching. And when looking at the whole of Paul's life mm -hmm. and what's said about him, this seems to be the case. However, the point cannot and should not be pushed. If the facts are accurate, then Paul would have sensed a deep inadequacy before the Corinthians because of their stress of eloquence and charisma in speakers. Mm -hmm. When Paul came to Corinth, <clears throat> He was sensing weakness in the ministry. He was sensing a great personal inadequacy. Mm -hmm. In the four cities where he had ministered prior to Corinth, he had faced great trouble in the ministry. In Philippi, he had seen a promising beginning smashed by the Judaizers or religionists, mm -hmm. and similar happenings occurred at Thessalonica and at Berea. Yeah. And in the city of Athens, from which he had just come, Paul experienced what some would say, a failure. Mm. And Athens was a great intellectual center full of philosophers swarming about with the latest philosophies and world news. And Paul had attempted to meet them on their own philosophic grounds mm. by reducing Christianity to philosophic terms. Whoa. He tried to speak to them in the wisdom of the world using their own terms and quoting their own authorities. But apparently his philosophical approach failed to reach many for Christ. And it seems that somewhere along the road, traveling between Athens and Corinth, 
Paul determined that he would forever after preach Christ and Christ alone. Amen. And he would preach it in the simplest of words. Paul determined that he would never again wrap up the story of Jesus in the words of human wisdom and flowery mm. speech. Unquestionably, Paul sensed a spiritual inadequacy and unworthiness in serving the Lord. And this is seen throughout his ministry. Amen. He knew that his sufficiency was in the Lord and in the Lord alone. He knew that whatever was done, if it was to have lasting value, it had to be done by the power of God's spirit. Amen. He knew that if anything was attempted in his own strength, it would fail and not last. Paul was describing his attitude and his state of mind, which characterized his whole ministry. Yeah. When he approached a person or people to minister to them, he ministered to them in personal weakness and fear before the Lord, even to the point of trembling. Mm -hmm. He sensed a hesitancy, a nervousness, a tension, a trembling apprehension, all of which was happening from a deep sense of inadequacy and the prominent importance of the work. But think about this. Mm -hmm. No one. Not a single one of us should ever stand before people in our own strength, yeah. depending on our appearance, our charisma, our ability, our wisdom, mm -hmm. or our novel ideas. Yeah. As a minister of God, you must know that not a single one of us can spiritually convert and change a single person. Amen. No one can deliver people from death mm -hmm. and no one can give people life that is both abundant and eternal. Yeah. Only God can do that. Yeah. Therefore, as a minister of God, you must live before God in weakness and in fear and trembling, always depending on God's spirit to equip you for proclaiming the gospel of God. Amen. Because it's God God and God alone who can give life and righteousness and it's God and God alone who can bear the permanent fruit of life and true righteousness. Ephesians chapter 3 verses 7 through 8 says of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power to me who am less than the least of all the saints this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Amen. Paul says, and my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. Sound preaching isn't persuasive words, but a demonstration of the spirit and of power. Amen. Notice the words speech and preaching. Paul was making a distinction between daily speech or conversation and preaching. Mm. And his daily conversations focused on Jesus Christ just as his preaching did. Paul sounds like me. Paul was saying that he had all what he had already stressed that he was determined not to know anything among people except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And what a dynamic example this is for us because our lives and our conversations mm -hmm. should focus on Jesus Christ every day, yeah. all day. Second Timothy chapter one, verse 13 says, hold fast the pattern of sound words, which you have heard from me in faith and love, which are in Christ Jesus when possible. And whenever the opportunity can be made, the theme of our conversation should be Jesus Christ mm. and him crucified. Amen. Our conversation should be Jesus Christ and him crucified at home. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ and him crucified at work, yeah. play, at school, in preaching, in teaching, in discussing, and in sharing. Yes. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 8 says, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. Amen. Paul said his speech and preaching were not with persuasive words and persuasive means enticing, convincing, credible, believable, and influential. But Paul's witnessing and preaching wasn't based on the enticing persuasive arguments of man's wisdom mm -hmm. and philosophy and demonstration means to show, present, reveal, display, or express with the most thorough evidence and proof. The idea is that the evidence presented is so strongly demonstrated that the truth is clearly seen. Yeah. 
And the only way your witness and preaching can be so strongly proclaimed is through the Holy Spirit and his power. Amen. The gospel of salvation can be convincing only when the Holy Spirit and his power demonstrates salvation. Mm -hmm. Acts chapter 4 verse 33 says, And with great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Amen. If you think about it, only the Holy Spirit can convict, convince, and convert or change a person's life to yeah. live for God. Only the Holy Spirit can impart life to a person. Yeah. Therefore, as a minister of God, you must surrender your life to the Spirit of God. You must be filled with the presence, the fullness, and the power of the Holy Spirit. That your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, mm. but in the power of God. Amen. Sound preaching leads to faith. But notice a critical point. The wisdom of people cannot save you. Only the power of God can save Amen. you. It's of no value to you whatsoever to know that Jesus Christ really lived, that he was a historical person, that Jesus Christ is really the Savior, mm -hmm. that he's truly the Son of God, and that other religions and positions just aren't true. Because your salvation can't stand in human knowledge mm -hmm. and wisdom of people. Amen. Human arguments and appeals may seem rational and logical, but they have no spiritual power whatsoever. Amen. No one, no speech, no preaching can convert a human soul and impart eternal life. Only God can do that. Hallelujah. Therefore, as a minister of God, you must speak and preach under the influence of the power of God's spirit. Because anything short of God's spirit places your faith in the knowledge and wisdom of people. And the crying need is for God's people to be controlled by God's spirit mm -hmm. so that God can demonstrate his power through us to a lost and dying world. Amen. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth and Jerusalem is local it's your neighbors your family your friends Judea is state Samaria is national and to the end of the earth is international Hallelujah. just remember that sound preaching isn't eloquence or human philosophy. That sound preaching has one great theme, Jesus Christ and him crucified. Amen. That sound preaching is proclaimed with a great sense of inadequacy. That sound preaching isn't persuasive words, but a demonstration of the spirit and of the power. And that sound preaching leads to faith. Years ago, a wise Christian said to me, when you're leading people to Christ, never tell them they're saved because they did this or that. Because it's the job of the Holy Spirit to witness to people that they are saved. And unless the Holy Spirit is at work, there can be no salvation. Amen. I also recall a fine professional man who faithfully attended church. A man who wasn't saved, but he wasn't opposed to the gospel. And many of us prayed for him as he continued to listen to the word. And one day a Christian friend of his decided to win him to Christ or else. And he spent several hours presenting argument after argument. And finally the man prayed the sinner's prayer. Then he stopped attending church. But why? And it's because he had been talked into something that wasn't real. Something he knew he couldn't follow through on. However, later on, he did trust Christ. And through the Spirit, he had the assurance of salvation. But up to that point, if anybody asked him if he was saved, he would simply, re he would simply reply, Sure, Tom said I was saved. Hmm. What a difference. When the Holy Spirit gives you the assurance that you're saved and sound preaching, the gospel is still God's power mm -hmm. to change people's lives. But effectiveness in evangelism doesn't depend on our arguments or persuasive gimmicks, yeah. but on the power of the Spirit of God at work in our lives and through the word that we share, Jesus Christ and him crucified. Let us pray. Father God, thank you for teaching us what sound preaching really is. The sound preaching is Jesus Christ and him crucified. Because only if we understand what you intended preaching to be, can we hope to solve our differences.
Now, Father God, as we prepare to leave this place, but never your presence, I ask that you would continue to bless us and keep us, that you would make your face shine upon us and be gracious to us, that you would lift up your countenance upon us and give us your peace. In Jesus' name, amen.